my messages uh, that I've given through the month of April have really been following up on our series on becoming a contagious Christian. Uh, and the last time I spoke, uh, it was about life in the dark, how, how we're called to function. Though we are children of light, though we are children of the day, we're called to function in the dark and to get out there into this world. It's all about doing that. We're working towards Party in the Park, which is one of our great opportunities to, as churches in Salford, show who we are, talk to people, engage with people, converse with people. That's happening on the 5th of July. There's going to be some training days, some evangelism training days that are going to be uh, taking place at Elmwood Church, operated by Victory Outreach, that are going to be tremendous opportunities to get out, not just to, to, to sit and listen about evangelism, but to get out and do it, going out into Salford Precinct, going out into, into Salford Keys. So we're going to be announcing more of that as the time comes near. When it gets to party in the park itself, we've delivered deliberately made in the afternoon. We've made gaps, 10-minute gaps all over the place in the afternoon where the music is just going to stop and there isn't going to be anything going on on the stage. You're just going to take a break. And in that break is the opportunity for you to get out and to start conversing with people, to get out and to start talking to people, to get out and to start sharing. And I know it can be a scary thing sometimes, but that, that is what God has called us to do. The God, Jesus Christ, who, who gave his life for us, who died on the cross, said, go into all of the world. And preach the gospel. Declare it to all creation. So everything that, that, that we're doing is really um, towards that still. And I, I'm still on that, uh, that same theme today. So my title today is just, just slightly different. We want to bring the first slide up. Um, I, I warned you that I was going to do this. Becoming a complacent Christian. The answer, thank you very much, Jen. The answer to the question, how do you become a complacent Christian, is the same as the answer to the question, how do you turn your garden into a jungle? You just don't do anything at all. You don't clip the hedge, you don't mow the lawn, you don't weed the garden, you don't do anything. You just leave it, and what will happen is that your garden will turn into a jungle or a wilderness. It happens bit by bit, and more than that, it will happen without you noticing. The grass just grows a couple of centimeters every week. The hedges just grow that little bit more. Imperceptibly, bit by bit, it happens, so you don't notice the change. We don't notice change over time, do we? I didn't look in the mirror this morning and say, Oh my God, I've changed so much since 2005. But somebody who hasn't seen me since 2005 might come in today and say, oh my goodness, the years haven't been very kind to you, have they? We don't notice because we see ourselves day by day. And complacency is exactly the same. It happens without us realizing bit by bit, day by day, little by little, unless you fight it. You can't leave it alone. You can't leave your Christian life alone. You can't say, oh, well, I made that commitment. I gave my life to Jesus. I gave my heart to Jesus. All those years ago. I said, that won't do. You've got to keep giving your heart. You've got to keep giving your all. You've got to keep giving him everything. You've got to keep your passion hot for Jesus Christ. Is there anybody who agrees with me? Yeah, in a half-hearted sort of way. Okay, we're, that's it's going to be different by the time we get to the end of today, Okay. What, what is a complacent Christian? I think before we answer that question, we've got to answer the question, what is a Christian? What is a Christian? We can't know what a complacent one is unless we know what a Christian is. A Christian is somebody who realizes that you have a desperate need of God. You've got a huge need of God. You need forgiveness. You need cleansing. You need putting right. You're lost without him. A Christian is somebody who realizes that when you've given your life to God, that your life is not your own anymore. You belong to God. You are somebody who has turned completely from your own way, old way of life. You've turned your back on all of your previous plans, your dreams, your hopes, your aspirations, your ambitions, whatever. They, they've all gone to the foot of the cross. And you committed yourself completely to God. You've done a simple equation in your head that said, Jesus gave, his, gave up his life for me, so I'm going to give up my life for him. 
Yeah. That, that's Christianity. That's the normal Christian life. You're very quiet, and I'm just thinking it's because you're just thinking about what I'm saying, but I'm sure you agree with me. A Christian is not somebody who is perfect. A Christian is not somebody who gets it right all the time. A Christian is somebody who can fall and can fail and does so. But there's somebody who has experienced the amazing goodness and grace and mercy of God. And you're sold out to that. 100% for God. Because my God gave 100% for me. Amen? That's Christianity. That's normal Christianity. So complacency is anything less than that. Complacency is whatever falls below that standard, anything that falls short of that. Now, I don't know about you. I do know about me, and I don't have a problem admitting that I fall short of that. I don't have any problem standing before you as a pastor, as a man who is supposed to be dedicated to God in some kind of special way. Well, you know what? I fall short, and I fail, and I find myself complacency and apathy and dryness and deadness can always set in very easily. Yeah? Okay, there's a few people who also don't glow in the dark. Good. That's great. Complacency, it, it sets in so, so easily. Am I 100% passionate for the Lord the whole time? No. Am I conscious of the greatness of what God has done for me the whole time? No. Am I, do I live my life with eternity in mind? Not all the time. So I, I'm, I'm saying, yeah, I fall short of that standard. And I'm not saying this to in any way condemn myself or yourself or anybody else. This is not a condemnation message. This is an encouragement message. This is a message to say there's more available for you. And if you find yourself dry and you find yourself getting a bit half-hearted and you find yourself look, going a little bit lukewarm, this is a message to stir you and say the God who put passion in your heart, the God who is a passionate God, can restore your passion again. He can, pour, he can pour water upon the dry ground. The God who says, I will pour water on him who is thirsty. I will pour floods upon the dry ground. If you're dry, don't worry, you've come to the right place. You've come to where the fountain of living water is. Jesus Christ, the fountain of living water, is able to revive you and to, to, to instill passion in you again. Who wants to be more on fire for God? I hope I see every hand. Who, come on, who wants to be more on fire for God? Give me a shout. Say amen. Come on. You're allowed to do that in this church. And, and if you find this a little bit hard and a bit challenging and a bit confrontational, I'm not apologizing. You know the preacher's job, to comfort the distressed and distress the comfortable. That's what we're here for. And, and I find that I have to challenge myself from time to time. I don't know about you. I have to pull myself up by the bootstraps from time to time. I have to say, and if, sometimes I can't find anybody else to do that for me. You know, who leads the leaders? Who, who's going who's gonna to inspire me? Thank God we've got a, a team of people. I'm, I'm not the only one preaching in this church week after week. Thank God I can sit down and listen to Pastor Paul and Pastor Deli and Pastor Joe and whoever's br bringing messages, and that's great. But sometimes we've got to challenge ourselves. And I'm just going to share with you the challenge that I feel God is bringing to me. And I, I hope you can walk along with me in that and, and not shut your ears to that. Is it okay if we just turn up the spiritual dial a little bit? If we turn the heat up a little bit, is that good? Okay. Because one of the things is, is that our nation, I know we're coming up to a general election and we've got politics and we've got all of that stuff, but whatever you think, of whatever your political views are or anything else, morally and spiritually, I think our nation is on a trajectory of destruction. I don't see good news when I look. The only bit of good news that I saw all week was when the, the royal baby was born. That was the only thing. Apart from that, I saw a lot of sad news. I lot of, saw a lot of tragic news. I saw a lot of distressing news. And I saw some horrendous news. Absolutely horrendous news. And you know the amount of light that the church is giving off. Who is the light of the world? Is it the Conservative Party? Is it the Labour Party? Is it the Liberal Democrats? Is it the Greens? Is it the Scottish National Party? Is it any of the, is it the monster raving loony party? The church. And don't tell me it's Jesus because he's not in the world. You are the light 
of the world. The world that is in darkness, it's that the measure of light that is in the church that is going to determine how dark things are around. It's the measure of light that the church is giving off that is going to determine the level of darkness in the nation. You know, when it's very, very, very dark, that is a problem. I remember uh, in my younger days going off and, and, and uh, hitchhiking in, uh, in, in the Lake District, and I got dropped off in the Lake District, and I walked along a road at night. There was no street lights, there was no stars, it was wooded over the, the road where I was. I couldn't see in front of me where I was going. I only knew that I'd wandered off the, the edge of the road when my feet started hitting grass instead of tarmac. I literally couldn't see where I was going. Very, very dark because there was no light. The light that our nation needs is right here. The light that our nation needs is in the church of Jesus Christ. And I just saw so much horrendous news. I, I read about a, a, a burial of a baby boy who'd been abandoned on, a, on an old railway path and just left there to die by his mother. Just, just tragic stuff. There was a grandfather convicted of murdering his baby granddaughter. There was a man who, who pushed a pregnant woman off a bus, pushed her off the bus, smashed her phone on the floor, punched her in the face. A pregnant woman punched her in the face repeatedly in front of her five-year-old daughter. The things that we're hearing are just incredible. In fact, there was a story of a man convicted of raping a one-day-old baby. And, and young toddlers. How You just wonder how much lower it can go. Is there anything worse that I could possibly hear? Is there anything lower that you could conceive of? How perverted and how wicked and how dark... Is this world. The amount of light that the church is giving off determines the dark, how dark things are around us. Salt preserves. You are the salt of the earth. In the old days, salt was so precious and so valued because you used it for preserving things so that they didn't go off and that the salt is applied to the earth to the world so that it preserves, so that the rot is, is stopped, so that it's held back in some measure. That's us. We're the light. We're the salt. So how important that we are passionate, that we are on fire, and that the God who desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth should find in us somebody who has a flame on the head and is saying, yes, I'm going out with, with the gospel of Jesus. Yes, I want people to know about the God that I served. Yes, Lord, I want to serve you more. Yes, Lord, I want to be wholehearted and not half-hearted. Amen. There's an amazing verse um, from the book of Ecclesiastes and it's Solomon talking. And I want you to bring up the next slide. Um, no, not that one. It must be the other way around. Can we go, go to the next one? That's the one. In my brief and pointless life, I have seen everything, including the fact that some of the good die young and some of the wicked live on and on. So don't be too righteous. Why be extreme? Why destroy yourself? And don't be too wicked either. Don't be a fool. Why should you die before your time? <laughs> Those are the words of the old Solomon. A compromised, complacent man who had lost his way. Dangerous and deadly and warped. Don't imagine that everything that you read in the Bible is good advice. It's not always so. The words of the devil are also sometimes in the Bible, as well as the words of God. You know, I, uh, I remember a story about somebody who, who really believed in just opening the Bible for a word. And he said, God, I just need some guidance what to do. I'm just going to open the Bible, and wherever it falls at, he opened the Bible, put his hand on the verse, and it said, Judas went and hanged himself. He thought, oh, no. He says, that can't be right. I'm going to look again. Maybe, maybe I need another confirmation. He turned to the next page, put his finger on it, he said, Go and do likewise. 
You can't use the Word of God. You've got to discern what is in the Word of God. But this is not godly advice. This is, this is the advice. This is in the Bible because God is saying, this is what happens to a man who's lost his way. This is what happens when all of your priorities and all of your principles go out of the window. Solomon, because of his, his love of many women, the, the, the hundreds and hundreds of wives that he had, said his wives turned away his heart to follow other gods. And the philosophies of those other gods and everything else found its way into Solomon's heart. And he ends up with this crazy, mixed-up attitude. What a, what a ridiculous thing to say. Why take risks being good? You just create trouble for yourself. Why go out on the streets and tell people that Jesus is alive? You're, going to in, you're only going to invite attack and trouble. Take it easy. Mellow down a little bit. Don't, don't take it too seriously. Don't overdo it. Settle down. Be moderate. Don't be extreme. Mellow a little. Don't be too righteous and don't be too wicked. How about a compromise? Somewhere in the middle is okay, surely. Well, God says the opposite. I wish that you were hot or cold. Either be on fire for God or else turn your back on it and walk away from it all and at least I'll know where you stand. But lukewarmness, lukewarmness is not something that is attractive to God. And I'm speaking for somebody who from time to time suffers from lukewarmness and I'm here on this pulpit today challenging you because I'm challenging myself. I need to, to shape up. I need to get passion back in my heart. I want to be 100% or no percent. I do not want to be 50%. I don't even want to be 80%. Because my God is a passionate God. And if he's put my, his spirit into my heart and if he's put his spirit into your hand, he can make you passionate as well. He can restore your spiritual passion. God said through Jeremiah to Israel, I remember the days of your youth when, when Israel was holiness to the Lord, when you, wandered, when, when you were like a new bride with a husband. What a time we had together. Israel was close. They listened every day. They listened to every word. They were dependent on me every day. They followed the pillar of cloud. They followed the pillar of fire. I remember. It's like God's remembering a romance. But to the church in Ephesus, he says, I, you've forsaken your first love. That first love that you have, I don't see it anymore. And it happens to us all. And it's okay, don't get condemned about it. But there's a way back. There's a way up. There's a way to something more. There's a way to, to restoration. Hallelujah. What's the characteristic of complacency? Go back to that other slide. The characteristic of, of complacency is... Satisfaction with things as they are. Satisfaction with the moderate, the mediocre, the passionless, the routine, the ordinary. It's the mentality that says, it's good enough. Is there something in you that hates that? Is there something in you that, that rises up against mediocre? How many people in here want to be a mediocre person? Thank God there's no hands raised. The, the, the mediocre people are the only ones who are always at the best. Let me say that again because you didn't get it. Mediocre people are the only ones who are always at their best. They'll never get above where they are right now because they're satisfied with where they are right now. A person who is, who is all out for God should always be pushing for more. Should never say, oh, I'm at my best right now. That should never be our declaration. No, I've got to go higher. Paul, at the end of his life, he's in prison. He's been here, there, and everywhere for the gospel. He's, he's not failed the heavenly vision. But he says, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. Not that I have attained or already been made perfect, but I press on that I may achieve, attain the, 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 the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There is more available to us. We can press on. We can always, we can always do more. I, I just feel repelled by mediocrity, personally, even though I find myself being sucked into it sometimes. I hate the idea of being boring, average, ordinary and dull. And I hope you do too. Do you not feel inspired by greatness? Do you not feel inspired by excellence? Do you not feel inspired by achievement? 
Do you not want to leave this earth having left a mark, having made an impact in this place? Does that not inspire you? That, you know why you've got that in your heart? Because God's like that. That's who he is. He's full of fervor and zeal and passion. And all you need to get more of that is more of God. That's all you need is more of God. But satisfaction with things as they are means that you're rejecting things as they might be. If you're satisfied with things as they are, then that implies your rejection of what could be potential. It could be so massively better, but it's good enough. Oh, God, spare us from that attitude. It's good enough. God put his spirit in you to make you a situation changer, to make you a life giver, to make you a Holy Spirit carrier, to make you a revival bringer. But there's an enemy who is at work to sap all of that vital life and energy and passion out of you. And you know what? We easily give up the fight. We easily give up the fight. Sometimes we don't fight back hard because we don't believe what God has put in us. We don't see the potential that is in us. You know, sometimes the devil sees more potential in you than you see in yourself. God certainly sees more potential in you than you see in yourself. But sometimes the devil sees it as well. And he knows that God's about to do something. God knows that the devil knows. He senses that something's on the cards. That you're about to go to your next level. So what does he do? He attacks. Now how are you going to fight back when he attacks? If you also believe that God has a destiny for you and God has a purpose for you and God has greater levels for you, then when the devil attacks and adversity comes along, you're going to say, okay, I'm not having this. I know what you're up to, devil. You're not going to have your way. I'm fighting back and I'm fighting back hard. But you know what? Usually because we've got a pretty poor opinion of ourselves and what God can do in us, when the devil comes in and attacks, all we do is we sit down and we say, oh, poor me, the devil's having to go at me again and I don't know why I get all of this trouble. And, and Can you pray for me, please, Pastor? I'm under attack, I'm under attack. And, and it's all negative because we don't... We, so the fight that we give back is pathetic and puny and weak. We need to learn to fight hard. Because there's a lot at stake. When the devil is attacking you, that means there's a lot at stake. If the devil's leaving you alone, don't say praise God. If the devil's leaving you alone, say, what's wrong with my life? What, why is there so little light? Is the cross not really made an impact in my heart? Why does the devil think that I am not worth bothering about? But if you are worth bothering about, praise God. And fight back with all of your strength and all of your might because you're on the verge, of, you're on a threshold, you're on your way into your next level. Adversity is just the, 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 the calling card of your next level. The arrival of an enemy is just like somebody dropping an invitation to a, to a, to a, a promotion in, in, in your front door. That's what it signals. So, so don't take it hard, don't take it, fight back. Fight back. God confronts complacency in the Bible. All, all over the place. Amos chapter 6. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. You sit there on your couches and you lie on your beds and you drink and the, the, the best wine and you, you eat all of the best food. And he lays into them. And he says, but you're not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. You're not grieved for the things that are on my heart. You're just self-satisfied and taking it easy. And you strum away on your musical instruments, but you're not grieved. And it would be a terrible rebuke, wouldn't it, on the lighthouse if God said to us, well, you have all of your, your praise and you come and you make yourselves comfortable and you have your conferences and your Sunday morning service, but where's the grief for what's going on in our nation? Where's, where's the intercessory heart? Where's the passion that I feel in my heart and I want you to feel as my people, the Lord would say to us. And in the New Testament, it's no different. It's not just an Old Testament thing. Revelation 2, I've already quoted it, the, the, the letter to the church in Ephesus. I know this and this and this and this about you. That's fine. You won't tolerate that and you've got a lot of truth. and you've got, But I have this against you. 
but you've left your first love. That which you had at the beginning. Like Jeremiah said, Israel was holiness to the Lord. But now you've gone lukewarm. You've got a lot of, you, you, all your doctrine's right. You've got a lot of truth. That's great. But where, where is the love that you first had? Can it be stirred up again? Can it be stirred up again? Can, yes, hallelujah. Repent and do the first works. Get back to where you are. Start doing what you did at first. Don't worry about feeling. Don't say, oh, well, I don't feel the same as I used to. Feelings follow doing. Get doing what you did first. That's, that's God's prescription. Get back to what you did first time. If the first thing you did was get on the streets and tell people about Jesus, well, do it again. And if you're not really excited about Jesus, find a way of getting excited about Jesus again. It's called the prayer room. It's called intimacy with God. It's called personal, private time in the Holy of Holies. God will pour into you a, a blessing that you cannot contain, which is exactly what he wants to do. He doesn't want you to contain it. Deliver us, oh God, from contained Christians. We want Christians who are overflowing. We want Christians who've got more than enough. We want Christians who are spilling over with enthusiasm and life and the love of God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's going to take me out and say, I can't just sit here any longer. I've got to go and tell someone. I've got to go and share what God has done for me. Revelation chapter 3, the church in Laodicea. You're neither hot nor cold, but you're lukewarm. You've slipped into pride and complacency. You're high on self-satisfaction, but you're low on passion. But God can restore that passion because God is a passionate God. God is a God who loves passion. And he's disturbed when passion has been lost in his people. Because you're being robbed of something that you could have. You're being robbed of your birthright. Your birthright and your inheritance is to live life to the full. Your birthright and your inheritance is not to be under all of the circumstances and continually weary and tired and oppressed and heavy laden. Your birthright is to be full of passion for God. Your birthright is to be being filled and filled and filled every day with more of the precious Holy Spirit. Keeping you on top of every circumstances. Your birthright is not to be down in, the, in the, the farmyard scrabbling with the chickens. Your birthright is to be soaring on wings like eagles above every circumstance. And if that's not your experience, God wants you to know that you're being robbed of your birthright and robbed of your destiny. And God doesn't like that because he wants the best for you. And he wants to see his church flourishing. He wants to see his church thriving. He wants to see his church built and he wants to restore your passion. In, there's an interesting story in the second book of Kings in chapter 13. It's about a king called Jehoash. He was the king of Israel and he visited Elijah when, when Elijah was very old. Sorry, not Elijah, Elisha. He visited Elisha when Elisha was very old. And Elisha said to the king, he said, get a bow and some arrows. And then he said... Hit the ground with the arrows. Hit the ground with the arrows. And Jehoash hit the arrows on the ground three times. And Elisha said, you should have struck the ground six or seven times. Because then you would have complete victory over the Syrians. But as it is, you'll only defeat them three times. Now if that was me... I would say, whoa, 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 hang on, Elijah, hang on. Let's rewind a little bit. Let's do it again. Give me the arrows. I'll hit them seven times. I'll hit them 20 times. I'll hit them 100 times. You, you didn't give me any warning. You didn't tell me what this was about. You just said hit the ground with the arrows. But Elisha would have said too late. I already found what I needed to know. You already told me. That was a test. It was a test of the king's passion and his zeal and his determination. And it was a test that had to happen without him knowing it was a test. And he revealed himself by his actions. And he revealed himself to be half-hearted. Passion. 
Is it there? Is it in your heart? What would you do? See, if Elisha had said, now, King Jehoash, I'm going to test your passion and your zeal and your determination. I want you to grab these arrows and I want you to smash them on the ground as many times as you can. And just show me how passionate you are. He would have got a completely different result. It wouldn't have been p p p would it? Anybody can prepare for a test if they know it's coming. But God's tests don't come that way. Low on passion. What have you settled for? Just bring the next slide out. Our greatest fear should not be a failure, but of succeeding in things that don't really matter. I think that's tweetable. Our greatest fear should not be a failure, but of succeeding in things that don't really matter. What matters in the long run? What matters at the end of your life? What matters when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ? What matters in eternity? Take inventory, take stock. You know, we need to let the Word of God offend us sometimes. The Bible says that the Word of God is an offense. It's a rock of, a, of offense. That's how the Bible, the, the Word of God defines itself, declares itself to be. Offense is a good thing. Because offense is what moves you from where you are, stubbornly entrenched, it moves you out of there and it gets in your stuff and it messes with you and it confronts you and it convicts you. That's good. That's good when that happens. It might be painful, but it's good. That's how you got saved. Somebody confronted you. The Word of God, the Holy Spirit convicted you and started messing with you and, and brought a conviction into your soul. And you knew that you had to get out of where you were and you knew you had to change. Now, I want to ask you, should that process stop once you become a Christian? Do you just say, oh, well, that's happened now. I've changed. I'm in the right place now. Conviction never needs to happen to me again. Con that, 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 that Holy Spirit never needs to speak to me again. No, of course not. We always need the Word of God to be an offense to us. If, if I'm greedy, then I need the Word of God to offend the, the, the message on, on, on giving or on fasting will offend me. Praise God. Let me be offended. Bring it on, Lord. I need it. If I'm stingy, then the message on giving will offend me. That's good. Bring it on, God. We, we should be con being convicted by the Holy Spirit on a regular basis. That's the sign that you're still growing. That's the sign that you're still growing. If you are changing from glory to glory and becoming more like Jesus, it can only be because more and more layers of stuff are being peeled back and exposed and confronted by the Holy Spirit. He's, he's a gentle confronter. He knows how to do it. He knows the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Living and active, alive, sharper than a two-edged sword. Piercing right through to where it matters. Right through to where you need to change because God wants to, to change you. God's answer to complacency is to keep on challenging you. God's answer to complacency is to keep on challenging you. Not just a one-off dedication, but a demand upon your life. Look at the life of, of Abraham. Abraham, leave your father's house, get up, leave everything, go to a land that I'll show you. Abraham says, yes, Lord. That's, that's the first thing, a massive upheaval, a massive change in his life, a massive change of priorities. But God's not finished with him. Abraham, I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward. You don't need anything but me. Yes, Lord. Abraham, don't take any gift from anyone. I know you haven't got any money. I know you haven't got resources, but I don't want you to take any gifts from anyone because I don't want anybody to be able to say they have made you rich. Rely on me totally. Yes, Lord. Abraham, believe me for the promise. Even though you've seen nothing and it's been years, believe me. Yes, Lord. God demands more and more and more. Come on, Abraham, give me more, give me more, give me more, give me more. And that's how Abraham grows. That's how he became the father of faith. 
And if you're going to be children of Abraham, you're going to go that same way. God's going to keep placing a demand on your life. God's going to keep challenging you. And it's up to you whether you step up to that challenge or not. But the outcome is going to be, do I grow or do I stay stagnant and stale? And complacency begins to set in. And finally, Abraham, take your son, your only son, who you love, and offer him on the altar to me. Yes, Lord. Now, Abraham, I know. Now I know. Because you have not withheld from me. You have not withheld from me your, your, your own life, your own ambitions, your own ideas, your own plans. You've given them all to me. Now I know. I'm going to make you great. Tremendous, tremendous things when we yield to the voice of God. Who's willing to hear the demand of God on your life? Who's willing to hear that call of God? The call back to passion. The call to be stirred again and moved again to revival and to fire and to life in all of its fullness, bringing the presence of God and the anointing of God. I want to wage war on complacency today. I want to wage war in it. Complacency is the sign of a tragically wasted life. Complacency is a sign that the devil is winning in my life. Complacency is a sign that the enemy is stealing life and potential and destiny from me. And I'm not happy with that. So I want to wage war. I want to turn up the spiritual temperature in my own life. I want to wage war on low expectations, low demands and a culture of half-heartedness. Why? Because I was not made to be half-hearted. I was not made to be mediocre. I was not made for complacency and apathy and compromise. If I, I, I may end my life burned out, but God forbid that I end my life bored. Bored out. I want my life to be gloriously spent, not tragically wasted. So I'll I'll say, if God's got challenges for me, bring it on, God. Bring it on. Let me know. Hurt me. Offend me. Tell me what's wrong. Come on, I can take it. Can you take it? Don't say it too easily. You've got to sit down. Jesus says, no man building a tower, no person with big ambitions, no king going to fight to war will not first sit down. He doesn't just jump up and say, oh, well, the, the, the Babylonians are coming against us. What are we going to do? Come on, let's fight them. We can do it. That's an idiot. That's not a good king. Sit down. Well, how many men have we got? How many men have they got? How could we do it? Have we got the generals who've got the strategies? Or had we better just capitulate and, and, and make some terms of peace and save thousands of lives from getting lost? That's wisdom. Sit down first. If you're going to build a tower and reckon whether you've got enough funds and enough materials and the right builders to be able to do it. Otherwise, everybody's going to say, oh yeah, he made a big noise about building that big house. And now look at it, sat there half finished, no roof on it. What a joker. Think about it. Consider, when God confronts you, are you going to say yes? I don't know. I hope so. I hope so. I hope that when God confronts me, I can say yes. I'd be an idiot to say, oh yeah, come on. I'd be a Peter. I'll die with you. I'll never deny you. I'll go anywhere with you, Lord. Liar. Because when God exposes your heart, you know. But God can do it for every one of us. God can do it if we're willing to accept the challenge. If you're dry, if you're going through dry places, if you feel that you're spiritually dry, if there's compromise of some sort in your life and you know it, if you've let yourself become complacent, if passion for Jesus has come a little bit down, the temperature's gone down, God's calling you back today. He wants to restore your passion. Who's up for that? Come on, let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet. You can be a passionate person in a mediocre generation. Worship team, come and join me. The world needs Christians who will not tolerate the complacency of their own lives. The world needs Christians who will not tolerate the complacency of their own lives. We're in the year of of, of, um, bronze to gold. Gold for bronze. We can up the level. 
this year? Do you want bronze membership or do you want gold membership? Hallelujah. Five people want gold membership. You can have it. If you say it, you can have it. If you want it bad enough, you can have it. God can put more fire into your heart than you've ever known before. God can restore your spiritual passion. Let's begin. Come on, let's lift up your voice to God. Lift up your hand to God. Lift up your hearts to God. God, restore our passion. God, the last thing that I want to be in this generation is mediocre. The last thing I want to be is lukewarm. Drive it away from us, oh God. Let the lighthouse never be a collection of mediocre people. Never a collection of compromised people. Always hot, fervent, full of zeal, passionate, serving you, our God. You gave everything for us. Can we not give everything for you? Oh God, come again into my life. Come again and restore the spiritual passion. Come again and stir in my heart a new zeal for you, a new heart for you, a new passion for you. Oh God, I remember what I've lost. I remember where I've come from. I remember from where I've fallen. And today I'm repenting, God. Today I'm turning my back on that. Today I'm saying it's, um, it's goodbye to half-hearted prayers. It's goodbye to just five minutes in the morning. It's goodbye to compromise. It's good, goodbye to complacency. I want to be on fire for you, oh God. Hallelujah. You are the God of fire. You are the God of grace. You are the God of passion. Put the passion back in my soul. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah.